I am Monica Benoit Beatty, the Executive Director of the Williamson County Children's Advocacy Center in Georgetown, Texas. A Children's Advocacy Center is a child-friendly place where children can come to safely talk about their abuse or about a crime that they have witnessed. The Advocacy Center conducts a forensic interview to obtain information from the child to reduce the number of times the child has to talk about what happened. The Advocacy Center also offers free counseling for children who have had a forensic interview as well as free training in the community on recognizing and reporting child abuse. The Advocacy Center also offers a place where a child can be seen by a nurse for a medical exam for allegations of sexual abuse. A Children's Advocacy Center plays a vital role in child safety by providing these services while working alongside law enforcement, child protective services, prosecutors, and other community agencies as part of a child protection team. If you have any questions about child abuse, advocacy centers, or are in need of resources in your community, please contact your local Children's Advocacy Center. We exist to provide services to abused children and their caregivers and to provide information about child abuse in the community when needed. You can go to nationalcac.org to find the Child Advocacy Center nearest you. My name is Amy Calloway, and I'm the Outreach Coordinator at the Williamson County Children's Advocacy Center. Physical abuse is an intentional act causing injury or trauma to a child by way of bodily contact. Such injuries often cause pain and often result in bruises, broken or fractured bones, welt marks, black eyes, handprints, or other types of physical indications. The bruising may be small or large in size and may be seen on one body part or on multiple body parts of the child. Bruises that result from physical abuse will often have a pattern such as a loop mark, lines, handprint, or an imprint where you can actually see the outline of the object that was used. We often see imprints from belts, handprints left on the face from a slap, or a split lip from when a caregiver got upset and hit the child. Significant bruising of the eye may be a result of the child being punched. Injuries to the chest wall are also of a particular concern since this is where all the vital organs are protected. With very young children, it's important to remember that if they're too young to be mobile, they should not have bruising on their bodies. Something to help you remember this is, if they are not cruising, they should not be bruising. Some burn marks may be a result of physical abuse. We suspect abuse if the burns are on the bottoms of the feet, in between fingers or toes, on or behind the ears. Abusers tend to leave marks or burns in places where they think that no one will notice. We often see burns that are small and round in shape, hidden in these places, indicating cigarette burns. Sock burns that go from the feet to the ankles may be a result of an accident or they can be a result of abuse. Accidents that present as sock burns may occur if the caregiver did not check the temperature of the water before they put the child into it. But sock burns may also indicate abuse, such as a caregiver putting the child in scalding hot water in a bathtub or sink as a form of punishment. A child may have a broken or fractured bone. Sometimes these breaks or fractures are from abuse and sometimes they are not. It's important to see what the explanation is that the caregiver gives to you and see if it matches that of the child. These explanations must make sense given the injury. Many caregivers will tell you that the child fell off of a bed, a sofa, or a chair in order to explain this type of injury to you. Doctors who are experts in the field of child abuse will tell you that it is not likely that a child will have a fracture or a break on their bone or get a significant bruise because of a short distance fall. Young children with lots of body fat should not have significant bruising, breaks, or fractures because the body fat that they have is meant to protect their skeletal structure. Their body should bounce and will absorb the impact of a short distance fall. 
If small children have significant injuries, it's extremely concerning and it should be taken very seriously. Sometimes children will fall, scrape a knee, or have a small bruise or scratch from playing outside or roughhousing with other children. These bruises can often be seen on bony parts of the body, such as on the shins, the kneecaps, and the elbows. These are normal and are not considered abuse. You may discover other marks on a child's body that are not indicative of abuse, such as irritated areas due to a skin condition, birthmarks, or Mongolian spots. We are often asked if it's okay to punish one's own child by spanking. This answer will vary depending on the specific laws in your state, but generally speaking, it is okay to spank your child as long as you're not leaving an injury on them, such as a bruise or any kind of bleeding, and as long as the spanking occurs on a place on the body, such as their bottom. Some redness may result from a spanking to the bottom. This is not abuse. Spankings to certain areas of the body are not okay. Spankings to the chest area, where the vital organs are, as well as spankings to the head and the face are not okay, and this could impact the child's brain, as well as their eyesight and their hearing. Sexual abuse is touching a child on their vagina, their penis, their breast, or their bottom except if the child needs help with bathing, wiping in their restroom, or a diaper change. Engaging in vaginal sex, anal sex, or oral sex with a child is also considered child sexual abuse. If there are children sexually acting out with other children, this too is of concern and needs to be reported as potential abuse. You should check with the laws in your state to determine the age at which a child can be held accountable for their own actions in a court of law. Sexual abuse often occurs when an adult or even another child has a child perform a sexual act on them. This would include a child having to touch someone else on their penis, their vagina, their breasts, or their bottom in any way. If an adult or another child shows their body parts to a child, this is considered exposure, and it is also abuse that must be reported. We live in an age where technology is a huge part of our lives. Sex offenders use this technology to their own advantage. They may send a child a video, a text, or a picture that is explicit in content. This is sexual abuse by displaying harmful material to a minor. Offenders may also tell the child to send them pictures, videos, or texts that are explicit in content. An offender may even take explicit videos or pictures of the child without their clothes on. This is considered child pornography. Sadly, offenders often lure children by sending them pictures or videos of their own body parts. The children receive these images and often do not know what to do, and they often don't know how to respond. If anyone comes across these images and an offender is sent to a child, this too must be reported to the police. It is important that caregivers be monitoring who their child communicates with, both in person and via the internet. Sex offenders use social media to lure children, but they are also now using apps on devices such as cell phones, tablets, and laptops in order to make contact with a child. It is important that any suspicions of any appropriate relationships discovered via technology be reported immediately to the police. This needs to be stopped as soon as possible in order to prevent them from doing the same thing to other children. We are also now battling something called sextortion, especially common in teenagers. Sextortion is where the offender befriends a child via the internet, such as on Facebook or via an app on their phone or computer. The child is persuaded to send them a picture of his or her body parts, and then the child is blackmailed into sending additional pictures to the offender by way of threats or sharing that picture to other friends on social media. These images that offenders are obtaining are often shared to sex offenders around the world. Once the offenders have these images, even the police cannot get rid of them. It's very important for caregivers to have internet safety talks with their children on a regular basis to inform them of the dangers that exist on the internet. There are developmental considerations to take into account when dealing with children. Young children between the ages of two and six will often pull up their shirt or pull down their pants and expose their own body parts. This is developmentally appropriate and is not considered abuse. They are finding out what body parts they have and distinguishing the difference between boys and girls. 
Children in this same age group may also touch themselves on their own private parts. This is normal and may be soothing to them, a behavior that calms themselves, especially if they are going from a high energy activity to an activity that requires being quiet and calm. If the child is touching him or herself briefly as a soothing behavior, this does not need to be reported. The behavior may become of concern if it becomes constant and the child seems to be fixated on the activity. This can be a sign of sexual abuse. However, when children have knowledge of sexual acts and sexual language, this is of concern. If you find yourself thinking, how does this young child know about that, you should be making a report. Other behaviors that need to be reported for young children are performing sexual acts on each other or trying to touch adults inappropriately. Examples would be a young child putting their hand down another child's pants, a child getting on top of another child and displaying sexual positions. Such behaviors should be reported since young children should not know these things. It's very important to understand who sex offenders are and how they think in order to help protect children. The offenders in child abuse cases are usually someone whom the child knows, loves, and trusts. Most often, it's the mother figure or the father figure living in the home with the child or someone that the child knows very well, like a family member or even a neighbor. It's very seldom a stranger. Sex offenders on average have 17 victims. If they are sexually abusing one child, they will likely have other victims as well. It is important to report any known or suspected abuse right away because you may be keeping it from happening to someone else. Please report that immediately. The process that an offender uses to gain the trust of a child in order to perpetrate abuse is called grooming. The offender will often seek out a child who is in need of a parental figure, a friend, or even a mentor. Sometimes they will choose children who are loners, who do not have a lot of friends, or a child who does not have a lot of supervision in their home. This provides the perfect opportunity to befriend the child and become their best friend. Grooming behaviors may include buying a child gifts, giving the child lots of attention, attending the child's extracurricular activities on a regular basis, and trying to spend time alone with the child away from other adults. Children like to feel special and they like the attention that they receive from adults, even when the adults may not have their best interests at heart. These children, therefore, do not question the attention that they are receiving. The more the child trusts the offender, the less likely the child is to tell or to realize that what is happening is abuse. This is exactly what the offender wants, their alone time, silence, and trust. Offenders groom children hoping to find the perfect victim who will not say no and hoping to never get caught. The child's caregivers are often groomed as well because the offender will tend to be very helpful to them. The person may offer to take their child to their activities. They will come across as being very friendly and trustworthy. Parents often do not question the offender because they see him or her as such a helpful and friendly person. Because caregivers often see this person as an outstanding citizen, they often do not truly realize what is happening. This is exactly what the offender wants to have trust and to not be questioned about their intentions of being around the child. Neglect is defined as failure to care properly for a child. Examples are not providing suitable clothing, nutrition, or shelter for a child. If a child is denied these necessities intentionally, this is considered neglect. The exception to this is when a family is poor and cannot afford the basic necessities. In this situation, the family should always be given resources to food banks, community agencies, churches, and shelters. If the family takes the resources and seeks the help, there is no need to make a report. They may have just been ashamed to just ask for help. Sometimes it's hard for a parent to say, I can't financially support my child, so often they say nothing at all. It is our job to realize that there is a problem and to offer resources to help with that problem. When a child starves, is left without shelter, or is denied proper clothing simply because the caregiver does not like the child or sees the child as a burden, this is abuse and neglect and merits making a report. Neglect can also include leaving a child at home alone for long periods of time by himself or herself. Consult your state laws to determine the age a child may legally be left home alone. 
The general rule that the child must have is the maturity level to know what to do in case of an emergency, and in general, they must know how to call 911 to seek help if there is an emergency. Medical care essential to a child's health, safety, and well-being must also be provided. Denying medical care vital to sustain the life of a child is considered neglect. Hygiene is recognized by professionals who are involved with teaching or caring for children as one of the most common forms of neglect. A child may not bathe on a regular basis and may smell or have health issues because they are not given access to a bath or a shower. Some homes where children live may not have access to water or electricity and may be unsanitary and unsafe. Should any of these concerns arise, it is important to make a report to Child Protective Services so that the resources may be provided due to health concerns and safety concerns. Alcohol and drug addictions are problems in our country. When a caregiver is under the influence of alcohol and or drugs, their ability to properly supervise children becomes a problem. A caregiver may use a normal, moderate amount of alcohol while caring for children. However, if a caregiver is under the influence that he or she is so drunk or high on drugs, this is a problem and must be reported because it is considered neglect. A caregiver may have an addiction requiring treatment. Their addiction does affect children that they are responsible for. For instance, many children who live in homes with parents who are addicts often grow up faster than they should because they are forced to be in charge of their own care and their own necessities. If a parent is passed out from alcohol or drug use, children learn that the only people that they can trust for necessities and safety are themselves. When children are neglected, they are also learning that they are not important enough to be cared for. This affects their self-esteem, their ability to trust others, and their emotions of feeling loved and cared for. Therefore, any concerns of drug use or alcohol dependency need to be reported to both the police and Child Protective Services. Every nine seconds in our country, a woman is abused because she is in a relationship of some sort where domestic violence is taking place. This means that many women in our communities are living in fear and feeling alone. And many of these women have children who are growing up witnessing violence and seeing their mother being beaten, verbally abused, and controlled. Does this happen to men too? Absolutely. Men can be victims of domestic violence as well. It can happen to anybody. Domestic violence falls under the neglect category of child abuse. Children in homes where there is a lot of violence often experience getting hurt themselves. Many people think that when there is domestic violence, a child will run away and hide to avoid what is going on. This isn't what we see as professionals. We tend to see the children getting involved in the dispute because they want to stop the fighting that is taking place. A child will often get in the middle of the fight trying to break it up. This can result in the child receiving an injury from getting involved. Domestic violence falls under neglect in the eyes of the law because there is so much risk of danger to the child. It is seen as neglectful supervision. Adults are leaving children in a dangerous situation and not removing them from potential harm. Often the person who is being abused is afraid to leave and cannot leave due to financial reasons. This is taken into account when considering who should be held accountable for the domestic violence in homes where children reside. Often children will not come right out and say that they are experiencing abuse. Instead, they may clue you in with their behavior that something is going on. You're not taking this from me! You can't have it! I said Many no. children will have a sudden, unexpected behavior change. At first, they may be very respectful, helpful, and calm by nature. This child may become very argumentative, disrespectful, and aggressive verbally, physically, or both. Some children may threaten to hurt others and or hurt themselves. When a child has a drastic behavior change and a threat of harm is expressed, pay attention and question the child about why they are having a difficult time without asking too many questions because you should not be doing your own investigation. Emotionally shutting down is also a behavior change displayed by many children who are experiencing abuse. This will often include symptoms of depression and untrusting behavior towards others. If a child becomes more protective of his or her body space by refusing hugs, moving away when someone moves towards them, etc., this too may indicate that something is wrong. Some children may adamantly refuse to be around certain people that they were previously okay with being around. This person may have done something that made the child feel unsafe and uncomfortable. This person could be their offender. 
For example, sometimes there are situations where relatives come and visit and a child is abused. The child's behavior changes shortly thereafter and the caregivers wonder why. Then some time passes, the offender has been away, and the child may continue to have problems. If the offender is scheduled to come back for another family get-together, that same child may become argumentative and refuse to be around the person who hurt them. This makes sense given that the child was abused by this person. If you see things or a caregiver tells you that these changes are happening with the child, it would be important to take notice and to make a report. My name is Frances DeLeon. I work at the Williamson County Children Advocacy Center and I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. Generational abuse occurs in many families in our communities. Generational abuse is where many family members have experienced abuse, sometimes even by the same offender. These caregivers will say, that happened to me, or I can't believe we are going through this because I went through it myself. We have seen cases where mothers were sexually abused by their own fathers. Then their children are sexually abused by them too. Such mothers often say, I never thought he would do it to my children. They become very emotional and begin to blame themselves for not knowing. To fully understand the dynamics of child abuse and to help families involved in child abuse cases, you must also understand trauma and how it affects people. Since many people have experienced their own abuse, they may want to tell you everything about what happened to them. This is because something has triggered them to think about their own victimization. Many things can trigger a memory that will cause them to experience the abuse again in their mind. It can be a place, seeing a certain person again, something someone says, or any number of other things. Trauma also affects memory. The children and adults you work with may not remember everything that happened to them. That's because they mentally checked out while the abuse was happening. It's a defense mechanism for when we feel threatened. They may not be able to tell you precisely what happened. This can be difficult if you are trying to help a person right after the abuse has happened. They may not be able to tell you the information you are looking for. Other people block out their abuse in their mind. They try to forget what happened by compartmentalizing it. It's kind of like sticking that memory in a cabinet and closing that door shut. Unwelcome access to the memory may occur suddenly when something reminds them of it. This defense mechanism is an attempt to move on without having to think about the trauma. Professionals who work in this field often hear, I don't remember or I forget. This is a normal response for those who have experienced something traumatic. They have put that memory away in hopes of not having to face it again. Every family has its own history, and each family is different in terms of its own dynamics and its own experiences. People that you work with on scene will react to what is happening based upon their own histories and experiences. Try to be as sensitive as possible because you never know what the family has been through and what each individual person has been through. Sometimes it's important to take a step back and look at that family from an outside perspective with an open mind. It may not be easy, but it may be very helpful for you when you need information. God, why'd you cook pork chops? You know I hate pork chops. You're stupid. I'm sorry, I forgot. They were on sale at the grocery store. I'm not eating this! Dad, stop! Not in that mouth! Kids, please go to your room. Don't you start either! I told you years ago, I don't like pork chops. You're f***ing stupid and you're useless! No, Sorry. Dad, please don't. Did I say you could talk? Some families have one specific person that is in charge of the home and the people that live there. This person is often the adult male that is the head of the household. He may be the one that makes all the decisions and wants to do all of the talking. 
If others try to speak, he may give them a dirty look or interrupt them and try and take over the conversation. These attempts to interrupt what is happening or silence another person may be a sign of dominance. Situations should be handled carefully when working with a family who has such a dominant family member. Children may not want to speak in front of this person out of fear or out of loyalty. It's important to remember that any conversations with children where you try to obtain information need to be done in a place where they can feel free to talk without fear. Sometimes this means you should try to talk to children away from the adults where they will not feel like they can't speak or where they won't edit what they say. Why do you keep doing this? Are you stupid? Do you even think before you act? I am tired of having to come around behind you and clean up your messes. You know, it's pointless. You're worthless. You're not going to amount to anything. You just keep messing up and I'm tired of it. I'm not going to follow you around your whole life. You're stupid. You don't think and you... I've had it with you. You know, there are days I regret ever having you. Do you know how utterly stupid you are? My name is Megan Humphrey and I'm a therapist at the Williamson County Children's Advocacy Center and I'll be talking today about emotional abuse. Emotional abuse is a pattern of behavior by a child's caregiver that results in psychological trauma to the child. Emotional abuse may include name calling, blaming, ignoring, isolation, and general neglect. For example, a child may grow up in a home with domestic violence and as a result fear for their own safety and the safety of others. The child may also be yelled at constantly and told that they're worthless or be called other bad names. The child may also grow up being confined in a closet as a form of punishment and this lowers the child's self-esteem. Emotional abuse can have a serious impact on a child's social and emotional growth. The child may experience difficulty in relationships and difficulty trusting others in their childhood and adult life. Emotional abuse is difficult to define and even harder to prove. Possible indicators to look for in emotionally abused children include bedwetting that is not tied to a medical condition, aggressiveness towards others outside of the home, or unusually good manners in order to avoid punishment at home. Some children may exhibit very adult-like behaviors, while others appear to be delayed in their development. Many emotionally abused children will be treated differently than their siblings. The child may be given older, used clothing and toys, and be deprived of proper medical care and hygiene compared to their siblings. Sadly, these children may also attempt suicide and run away frequently during their childhood and adolescence. Although this is very hard to prove, CPS will be more willing to take a report and investigate if the child states that their behaviors are a result of their parents' maltreatment. In this room, we're gonna be talking about some very important things and I'm going to be asking you questions, okay? So tell me, why are you here today? Because something happened. Okay, something happened. Tell me about that. What happened? A disclosure is a child's statement about abuse that he or she has experienced. People may disclose their victimization at various points in their lives. Some people tell right away, others may wait until later in life. There are even some people who are victims who have never told anybody about their abuse at all. Only 1 in 10 victims of abuse will actually make a disclosure. It's very important to take these disclosures seriously because that individual may never talk about it again. It's also important to discuss the different types of disclosures in order to understand what is going on in the mind of a child. Each type of disclosure is dependent upon the age of the child, the circumstances of the child, and the child's family dynamics. Some disclosures are dependent upon the verbal capabilities of the child. Some children are too young to have the vocabulary to be able to tell you about what happened. And some children have disabilities that render them incapable of communicating at all. 
When children are not yet verbal or have a disability that limits their communication, it is important to remember to follow your gut instincts and pay attention to their behavior and their living environment. The first type of disclosure is called an accidental disclosure. This type of disclosure takes place when a caregiver, a teacher, a counselor, or other authority figure learns of abuse from a child who has never spoken about what has happened to them. Some of these children do not know that what they have experienced is abuse and therefore they do not say anything. They think that what is happening is normal. Other children may know that what has happened to them is abuse, but they keep it a secret, perhaps to protect the offender. Examples of an accidental disclosure could include a mother walking in and seeing her son sexually abusing her daughter. Another example could be a physical abuse incident discovered on a phone and turned into the police without the child's knowledge that it was turned in. A third example would be a mother looking at her daughter's apps on her phone, Facebook, or text messages and discovering that she has been communicating with a much older adult male. The daughter says, I love him, he's not doing anything wrong. Another example of an accidental disclosure would be a very young child randomly blurting out to someone that Uncle Johnny touched his peepee -pee because the child doesn't understand that this is sexual abuse and therefore thinks that he has been playing a game with Uncle. I didn't want to tell Mom that Andy was touching me. She walked in on us and now everyone is going to know. I said Dad touched my peepee. -pee. Why is everyone mad at Dad now? We met on Facebook. He said that he loves me. I know he's way older than me, but I love him too. The second type of disclosure is called a tentative disclosure. This is when children may tell you only a little bit of information. Usually it's the who and the what, keeping it very brief without revealing too much information. Children may tell you one sentence about their abuse, and then they will stop and read your reaction to decide if they should tell you more or tell you less. If you appear supportive and calm, they may decide to open up and tell more information about the abuse. If you panic, appear angry, or are beginning to judge them based on what they said, they will likely not tell you any more information. It is important that you guard your reactions, especially with children who were in the tentative disclosure phase. Mom took that well. I think I can tell her more about what happened to me. Mom is crying and really mad right now. Is she mad at me? I'm not saying anything else about what happened. I'm in trouble. A purposeful disclosure occurs when children deliberately tell of their abuse so that the abuse will stop. Or perhaps one child is protective of another child, so he or she decides to report the abuse. The child will tell a trusted adult hoping for help. When children start talking, they will often give a huge amount of information about the incidents. You may feel like a wave of information is hitting you because they have been holding everything in for so long that they overwhelm the adult with details in order to get everything out in the open. Some examples of this would include a student walking into the counselor's office at school and breaking down in tears. She reveals in great depth that her stepdad has been molesting her for years. She wants it to stop because she fears that he is going to molest her little sister too. Another example would be a child running to a neighbor's house in the middle of the night and saying that his dad just hit his sister so hard with his fist that there's now blood streaming down her head. The child tells the neighbor that dad always gets really violent when he's been drinking and begs the neighbor to call the police and keep him safe. I really need to tell you something. My grandfather has been touching me for years and I want it to stop. He's scaring me. He may be doing it to other kids too. Please help me. There are so many reasons why children decide to keep their abuse a secret. Fear is often what silences them. They fear that they will not be believed. They fear that they will be punished for telling. They fear that their family members will be harmed if they report what happened to them. We teach children growing up that family is important, and we reinforce those family bonds with values, morals, and belief systems. Many children keep their abuse a secret because they feel that they must be loyal to their family and that no matter what, blood is blood. Wow! You have really created a mess! You are the reason that your father is going to jail! I hope you're happy! This is all your fault! You are breaking up this family! Our life is going to be so much harder because of you! You happy now, you little punk? You got what you wanted, didn't you? I'll get out, and then 
what happens when I get out, huh? Many children are aware of the consequences of what could happen if they tell about the abuse they've endured. Many children will ask, is my mom or dad going to jail? The fear of their caregiver being locked up and going away is another fear that often silences children. Many thoughts go through the minds of children while they contemplate disclosing abuse. Many know that child protective services may come into their lives when something is wrong. Children may fear child protective services because they think that if CPS shows up that they are going to get taken away from their family. This does not happen as often as people think that it does. Many other interventions can be considered besides taking a child out of his or her home. This is done only as a last resort when other options have failed. Many children, especially older children, may also worry about the family finances. They worry over what can happen if the parent goes to jail and the family loses an income. Will they have to move? Will they have to switch schools? Will they have to lose access to all the things that they enjoy because they cost too much? These thoughts and fears often keep a child from telling. In summary, it's always important to look at how a child views his or her world. If you look into things from their perspective, it will help you to better be able to work with a child in order to keep him or her safe. Many children and families fear the police and they fear Child Protective Services. They may have been taught that all people who are police, Child Protective Services, and emergency personnel are bad people. If the family has had prior involvement with these agencies, the child and the family may be fearful or angry and may not want to talk. You may see anger, fear, or resentment from families because of past bad experiences. It's important that you take the time to make the family feel at ease and explain what you can when you show up on scene in order to create a team-like atmosphere which will help ease any tension that may exist. This will help a child to feel more comfortable talking with you too. Devin, my job is to help people in many ways and make sure that people are safe. Tell me about what happens when you get in trouble at home. Well, my dad hits me on the back really hard and it really hurts. I saw that, that bruise on your back and I want you to know that it's never okay for someone to hurt you like that. It's not your fault and I'm glad that you told me. He hits my sister too and he's broken. The best way to work with a child when you need information is to be brief and use the phrases, tell me about, and help me understand. These are two phrases that you should use when you need more information or clarification about what has happened. As you work with families, please do not do your own investigations by asking a lot of questions to obtain information about the abuse. There are two main reasons for this. When people ask a lot of questions, it can cause serious problems in the investigation and in trial. Children also get tired of having to tell about what happened to them. Please, unless you have questions related to their medical needs, don't ask additional questions once they have disclosed to you that there is a problem. Sometimes children come back at a later time and recant their disclosure. This is when a child decides to take back what he or she said regarding the abuse. He or she might say, I lied, or that didn't really happen. There's often a reason why the child is recanting. Why do recantations happen? Children may feel guilty that their family member is in trouble. The child may have family members that are blaming them for the abuse, which makes the child feel guilty as if he or she did something wrong. The child may have also had to switch schools because the offender was put in jail and the financial situation has changed. A child may feel that if he recants, life will go back to the way that it was before. He would rather deal with the abuse than be blamed or have his life or the life of his family drastically changed. Do help the investigators avoid child recanting by being very supportive of the child with whom you are working. Let the child know that he did the right thing by telling and that he is brave. If you know the caregiver is getting angry, separate the child from the caregiver if possible. Children do not need to see their caregiver angry. This is often interpreted by the child as an indication that he has done something wrong. When you are on scene and you suspect abuse or perhaps a child actually discloses to you, believe the child and follow your gut instincts. Stay with the child so that she feels safe and protected. If the child asks you questions during a medical emergency or some sort of trauma about her family members and whether or not they are okay, let them know that someone is helping their relatives. If you find out about child abuse, do not let the caregivers know that you are making a report. It is best for the caregiver to be kept in the dark about any report being made. 
If you feel that the caregiver is going to influence their child in any way, try to keep the child and caregiver away from each other. If the caregiver insists on being with their child, stay with the both of them so that the caregiver doesn't talk to the child about keeping the abuse a secret. And lastly, try to keep the scene as peaceful as possible until the police arrive. Hey Amy, this is Anna with Williamson County. I need to make a report about a child. His name is James and he's nine years old. He has a, a large bruise to his lower back. It's a uh, blue and purple, it's about eight inches in diameter. It's uh, circular. We showed up on scene uh, called in by law enforcement due to a domestic abuse call. During my conversation with James, he mentioned that his dad... If you know or suspect that abuse is happening, it is mandated by law that you report the abuse or your suspicions of the abuse. You must make reports to law enforcement and to Child Protective Services if a child is in danger. You should involve Child Protective Services when the person who is abusing the child is a caregiver or a family member. You will rarely know that abuse is happening for sure unless you see it with your own eyes. Therefore, you must report your suspicions. Please do not be making your reports in front of the child. This may cause the child to shut down and not talk to law enforcement or Child Protective Services. You cannot have someone else make a report of abuse for you. If you know it or suspect it, you must be the one to report it. It's the law. You can be held legally liable if you know or suspect abuse is happening and you do not report it. You may be the outcry witness in a child abuse case. An outcry witness is the first adult that the child tells about the abuse. This is the only person who can testify in a courtroom about what the child said, since the adult heard it directly from the child. Make sure that your reports of abuse are very thorough. Document exactly what happened when the child disclosed to you. You will probably not know that you are the outcry witness when you first hear from the child, but it's important for you to always record in great detail what was going on and what the child said in order to help the case and to help you yourself remember what happened should you receive a subpoena to testify. Every time you make a report, you should document the following information. The date the child disclosed to you. The child's name. What you were doing with the child when the child made the disclosure. For example, we were sitting on the porch outside while one of my partners was assessing the mother inside for chest pain. I noticed that the child had a large red and blue round bruise about five inches in diameter on her upper right arm near her shoulder. Also, please document what the child said when you had a conversation with them. You also need to document who you reported the information to. You will want to write down the names of the professionals that you reported to and which agency they were with. These people will be able to back you up should there ever be a suspicion that you did not report abuse. Familiarize yourself with protocols of your agency and the laws of your state regarding reporting child abuse. Make sure you know how to contact Child Protective Services. Keep this information with you at all times in case you need it. When making your report to Child Protective Services and law enforcement, please share all concerns you have about the family. If you have information about the family history, including medical history, share this information. Be very descriptive about what happened when you interacted with the child and the family. The more details that you report, the more help it can be to these agencies making decisions about the investigation. Also share any concerns that you have regarding drug use, alcohol use, supervision issues, safety, or any other concerns you had while interacting with the family.